Okay, that takes us to item 10B, which is a briefing on the Fukushima nuclear disaster and radioactivity along the West Coast. Now, we have gotten a number of inquiries on this subject, um, including one by Chair Kinsey. And so I asked uh, Joe Street of your staff to research the topic and provide a report to you. So to my left is Joe. Uh, Joe is a former Sea Grant Fellow with the Coastal Commission, and we're incredibly pleased that he's now working as an environmental scientist uh, with, with the, ocean, the Energy, Ocean Resources, and Federal Consistency Division. Now, if you haven't had a chance to read this report yet, I really encourage you to do so. Joe did just a ma marvelous job wrapping his arms around the science of this subject and then presenting it to a lay audience. So today, Joe's going to give you a, a, a brief presentation on his research and conclusions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Chair Kinsey, as Allison said, this is a briefing report on the Fukushima disaster and the implications for the California coast. And the pur the pur purpose of this presentation is pretty basic. It's to provide the commission with staff's research and an assessment of the situation. Um, there's more detailed information in the written report that Allison mentioned. Next slide, please. The basic outline of the initial disaster, well, we're sort of waiting for the slide, but I can continue talking, is probably fairly familiar to you. On March 11th in 2011, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake occurred off the coast of the Tohoku region of northeastern Japan. The earthquake triggered a series of massive tsunamis that struck the coast within 15 minutes of the quake, inundating large areas of the shoreline. And as you can imagine, the combined effects of the earthquake and tsunami were devastating. Next slide, please. Now, the nuclear portion of the accident occurred approximately an hour after the earthquake, after tsunami waves of up, up to 14 meters in height overwhelmed the seawall protecting the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Much of the plant was flooded, which caused the failure of backup generators that had kicked in and had been powering the plant when the grid failed during the earthquake. Without power, the cooling systems at several of the reactor units failed. The reactors overheated and several explosions and fires occurred. This chain of events led to a large release of radioactive gases and volatile elements to the atmosphere, mostly in the week following the accident. In addition, in several weeks and months that followed, emergency cooling water that had been used to dissipate heat in the damaged reactors was discharged directly to the Pacific Ocean, creating a second pathway for the release of radioactive materials. Next slide, please. Now, most of the radionuclides released to the atmosphere in the week after the accident were deposited by rainfall over Japan and especially the western North Pacific Ocean. The rest was rapidly dispersed and diluted over the northern hemisphere over the, next, the following two to three weeks. The slide here, which I hope you can see the colors of, shows a model simulation of this process. And the colors represent the concentration of radioactive materials. It's important to note that the scale on this slide is logarithmic. So the oranges, yellows, and greens that you see are actually diluted by hundreds or thousands of times from the initial concentrations over Japan. Airborne radioactivity was first detected in California about five days after the accident peaked in late March, and had mostly disappeared by the end of May. Radionuclides that were deposited in rainfall were later detected in low concentrations in food and water in the first few months after the accident. Most of these radionuclides that were present in the atmosphere were short-lived, with half-lives measured in days. This means that the primary exposure of people and ecosystems in California to Fukushima radiation was a short pulse in the spring of 2011. Longer-lived isotopes, particularly cesium, which has two radioactive isotopes of 137 and 134, were present in the fallout and could result in longer-term exposure. However, as I'm going to discuss in a couple of minutes, the radiation exposure in California has been very low relative to pre-existing sources from natural and, and human-caused radiation sources. Next slide, please. The second major dispersal, dispersal pathway for radioactive materials from Fukushima is in the slower currents of the North Pacific. The oceanic plume includes both fallout to the North Pacific and direct discharge from the plant. As in the previous figure, there is a model simulation of the dispersal of the radioactive plume in the ocean. The time scale is over a period of 10 years. 
In the ocean, the main radionuclides of concern are those long-lived cesium isotopes, since they persist long enough to still be present years or even decades after the accident. Again, it's important to emphasize that on this figure, the concentrations are plotted on a log scale, so even the relatively warm colors you can see um, represent a massive dilution from the initial concentrations off the coast of Japan. The spatial patterns and timing shown here we believe are pretty accurate. They're backed up by direct field measurements, which are, of course, are sparser than what you can achieve with a model si simulation. Um, but the field measurements also show that the actual levels of radioactivity in the eastern Pacific along the west coast are up to 10 times lower than the model predictions, probably because the model did not anticipate the amount of mixing into the deep ocean that appears to have occurred. Fukushima-derived cesium reached the coast of North America off British Columbia last summer, but the plume has not yet reached the California coast. You may have seen some headlines last week reporting that no uh, radioactivity from Fukushima had been detected in the latest round of sampling of giant kelp off the California coast. The fact remains, though, that the oceanic plume will probably be detected within the next, few, the next year or two the cesium concentrations will be very low relative to natural sources of oceanic radioactivity. But Fukushima's legacy will be detectable off our coast for many years. Next slide, please. With, it, with this in mind, it's worth mentioning that to date, neither the state nor the federal government has mounted any sort of monitoring campaign for Fukushima radioactivity off the California coast. And that we owe our current knowledge to academic researchers and several citizen science efforts. As a quick aside, I wanted to acknowledge these efforts, which are largely supported by volunteers, individual donors, and small research grants. Next slide, please. The basic message that we've heard from governments since 2011 is that our exposure to Fukushima radiation has been very low and poses little risk to human health or ecosystems. Staff's conclusion, based on the best available science, is that this consensus is essentially correct. Compared to other sources of radiation exposure, both natural and human-caused, Doses from Fukushima in the United States have been very low. Now, this figure in the blue box here shows several maximum estimates of annual doses from Fukushima from different sources in California. I should point out again that this chart has a log scale, meaning that the Fukushima doses in California are actually thousands of, thousands of times lower than what we're already receiving on a yearly basis from both natural and other anthropogenic sources. Um, and they're also tens of thousands of times lower than the lowest dose that has been linked to any uptick in cancer rates, which is shown in red on this figure. This is not to say that the exposure to radiation from Fukushima is benign, but rather that the con contribution to our cumulative dose is fairly small, at most roughly equivalent to a few extra, a few extra dental x-rays. Next slide, please. As a final note to put the Fukushima event in perspective, I wanted to show you this slide, which compares the cesium-137, which is the longest lived isotope um, that's being detected in the oceans in any con high, con well, I shouldn't say high, but any measurable concentration. Um, this compares the amount reaching the ocean due to the accident with other natural and anthropogenic sources of radioactivity. Fukushima is shown here by two relatively small ovals, representing both the direct discharge and the fallout contributions. Um, together, they, at, at the highest estimates, they're about equivalent to the contribution from the Chernobyl disaster in 1986. But Fukushima's contribution is much smaller than that from nuclear weapons testing in the 50s and 60s, and is dwarfed by the large reservoir of radioactivity from naturally occurring elements, such as potassium-40 and uranium-238. All this being said, I think there's a second perspective that can be drawn from this diagram, and that is that the Fukushima disaster is just the latest example of a human action or activity which has injected a pulse of artificial radioactivity into the ocean. A figure like this shows that each pulse, such as the weapons testing, Chernobyl, Fukushima, has been relatively small relative to the natural background, but it also obscures the cost in terms of human suffering and environmental damage that these actions and accidents have caused on local and regional scales, in this case in Japan. I wanted to point this out lest we start feeling too sanguine about the outcome of the Fukushima disaster and other instances where radiation has leaked into the environment. So with that said, I will conclude staff's presentation and I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you.
Good, uh, at this point in time, uh, we are going to report out from closed session. I'll ask Hope Schmelzer, our counsel, to make the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, in closed session, the California Coastal Commission received litigation information and advice in a matter of threatened litigation and gave direction to, to staff. Thank you. Thank you. And this completes the uh, May meeting of the California Coastal Commission. Commissioner, uh, comments, questions? Commissioner Howe? Thank you. Um, so I saw on your charts that you mentioned uh, that uh, radioactive, oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, tuna, uh, the dosage you would get from eating tuna. Uh, are there other fish that uh, concentrate their radioactive metals? Yes. Um, there's been a lot of work done in Japan on you know, radioactive elements in, in fish, and they've detected very high concentrations in some cases. It appears to be very species specific. And the reason I put tuna up there is that it's a really, it's a highly migratory species. So fish that were raised, well, I don't know if raised is the word for fish. I don't know how much nurturing they do. But fish that were, fish that were hatched and, and um, matured in off in the Western Pacific were exposed to a certain level of, of radioactivity and then they actually migrate over the course of their life cycle into the Eastern Pacific. And over that time, the level of radioactivity um, that accumulates in their tissues decays away with, uh, with the elements. But it has been detected in tuna off the California coast. And that estimate of the dose you would get that I showed in that figure would be for someone who eats a lot of tuna. We're talking a subsistence a subsistence level fisherman who only ate that species. Um, it's very likely that other migratory species that spent time in the Western Pacific and have come to the Eastern Pacific also would have low levels of, of Fukushima radioactivity. Um, among the species that have been tested that are local to the California coast, um, nothing's been detected thus far. Thank you. Commissioner Mitchell. I have a question, and this may not be your area of expertise, but um, what is the difference between the Fukushima nuclear power plant and the power plant, the nuclear power plants in California? Because I, I was, when I was reading about it, that apparently we have different types of, of nuclear power plants that could make this, you know, a different situation. So I'm just uh, curious about that or what you know. Yeah. I don't know specifically whether the type of reactor or plant that exists at Fukushima is, is the same as, say, Diablo Canyon or, or uh, San Onofre. I know that people have considered whether or not a similar type of disaster could affect the plants that we have along the California coast. But I, you know, I, I Maybe I can do another briefing report for you on, on that question. There, there has been some modeling work done if you had a, you know, a, a Fukushima-sized disaster along the California coast, how would the radioactivity spread? And you know, my recollection is that you know, a substantial number of people along the California coast would be exposed if something like that happened, which is probably not a surprising finding. I did want to thank you, though, for your great report and great presentation here. Welcome. Thank you. Commissioner Duclos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Also, I want to thank you for your report, and uh, it's very useful. I, I had a question about debris fields, and, uh, and, and those didn't manifest themselves in the way that they were anticipated, but uh, I'm wondering, are there, and you said part of the reason for the radiation levels was sort of the settling effect but uh, is do you see any um, any th any greater threat for debris fields that might contain higher concentrations of radiation the, and, and are we still going to see this um, are we are we going to see, see this happen what the predicted you know, uh, outcome of of these debris fields working their way down the California coast 
Well, um, I wish that um, one of our staff members, Eben Schwartz, who's in our public education um, program, was here because he's done a lot of work on Fukushima debris. And my understanding is that, yes, we have found Fukushima debris along the West Coast, but that the samples that have been tested have not had any detectable level of radioactivity. So without claiming to be absolutely confident, 100% confident in this, I'd say that the debris fields themselves don't seem to pose any additional danger you know, compared to these other modes by which radioactivity has been transported. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other, oh, excuse me, Commissioner uh, McClure, I apologize. <laughs> yes, I want to thank you for your report because it's not often that a layperson can get through a 25-page plus report on scientific data and understand it. And it was it was so well written. I just really appreciate the information and and how you delivered it. It was absolutely excellent. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, Allison. Thank you. We have one last item today, which is revised findings for San Diego Gas and Electric's proposal to relocate a substation in Chula Vista. This is item 12A. Uh, if you recall, in March, the Commission approved this project and added two special conditions. Uh, one requires SDG&E to, five, to provide $500,000 to the Friends of the San Diego National Wildlife Refuge to mitigate for wetland impacts. And the other condition addresses the loss of visual access by requiring um, $2 million for an endowment fund to support the uh, continued operation of the Living Coast Discovery Center. So these are proposed findings in support of those two conditions. Uh, we're not aware of any uh, objections at all to this, and therefore we seek your adoption of the revised findings. Uh, the motion and resolution begin on page 8 of your staff report. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cox? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move that the Commission adopt the revised findings in support of the Commission's actions on March 13, 2014, concerning the Commission's Coastal Development Permit E-11-010. And I would uh, ask for a yes vote. Motion. Is there a second? second. Uh, motion and a second. And uh, I have no public speaking cards. Is there any unwillingness for unanimous yes vote? Seeing none, uh, we approve the findings. And uh, with that, I think we will move into our closed session at this point. Okay, looks like people are jumping everywhere. Commissioner Mitchell, Sorry. And, then, um, and then Hope. So I've been reading recently about the Santa Barbara desal plant and them trying to get it up and running again. What's the status of that? What's our, what's our, sorry, what's our role in that? And um, what's the, a little more of the background the article I read didn't have. When, when did we approve it and all of that? Uh, sure. Thank you. So the history here is that back in 1991, I believe, the, um, we approved a, uh, an emergency permit for the desal facility in the city of Santa Barbara. And then in 1996, the commission approved a permit for a more long, a long-term facility. Um, I don't know what year it was, uh, perhaps Commissioner Zimmer knows this, where the, the city decided that they didn't need to be using uh, that desal plant and started to remove components of it. I don't know if I'm on. Am I on? Um, so yes, we got word from the city that they now, uh, because of the drought, that they want to uh, restart a desal facility in the restart that desal facil facility within the city of Santa Barbara. Um, we started to have discussions with them. We actually have a meeting with them next week. Um, initially, out of the gate, uh, they believe that they did not at all require um, either a new permit from us or an amendment to that 1996 permit. Uh, based on the facts that we know at this time, uh, we disagree with that, and we wrote a letter to them. Um, I believe a couple of weeks ago now, saying that we do believe that um, they need to get a permit modification for what we understand that they want to do. Um, and then we also initiated discussions with them about how the landscape 
uh, around desal has really shifted a lot since back in 1996, and we've learned a lot of new information about the effects of open ocean intakes, which is what we had approved back in 1996 was an open ocean intake. Um, last week I had a, a, a phone conversation with the planning director at the city, the city attorney and the assistant city attorney um, about uh, what other local water districts and other local governments and private proponents of desal are doing first, which is to look at alternatives to open ocean intakes as a starting point and going offshore and doing these feasi feasibility studies, which is also being supported by these other agencies, because as you know, the state board is working on this desal policy, which by the way, we think it's going to come out in June. So. Um, Based on these conversations that we've had with the city, they are also going to go uh, next week, I believe, and present their proposal before the multi-agency desal working group that includes representatives of the state board, state lands commission, ourselves, about what they want to do. And then the very next day, we're actually meeting with the public works department and the planning department at the city uh, to talk about um, our recommendations for how they proceed here and to get more information from them regarding the facts there. What, what equipment have they removed and disposed of, and what's their proposal? So just to follow up, isn't there, I mean, you, you, was it approved in 1991 or 1996? In 91, we did an emergency permit. permit. In 96, 96, we did a follow-up. So isn't there some time limit on the permit? I mean, how does that, it's just... Or, or if they built it, then there's then it just is permitted. And well, I think I think it's the city's position is that they have an active permit that's vested, mm -hmm. and based on the facts that we r know right now, we think they essentially decommissioned it, and so therefore they should be getting a new permit. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hope. Oh, oh whoops. Uh, we're just moving into commissioner comments here. Uh, commissioner Duclos. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just I wanted to follow up on that because uh, I had uh, I'd heard some news that the uh, I, th I believe it's a PG&E project there in Redondo Beach that uh, they did, had a demonstration desal plant there that is now going to, or is planning to go online, or at least the preliminary process of going online somewhere around the Dock Waller Beach area. I had heard that to be true. Uh, I'm wondering, given that there's a policy statement and given the fact that, you know, the Huntington Beach project is moving along, it, it does staff plan to bring it back a sort of statusing on desal throughout the state in terms of projects where they're at what's planned y yes we do as a matter of fact charles and i talked about this very question this week and thought that maybe in the summer it would be a good time for me and tom luster to come back and speak to the commission and i, I was thinking the best the timing of that would be good after the draft desal policy comes out from the state board and we're expecting that in june so maybe july or august thank you Thank you. Okay. Uh, now, Hope Schmelzer. Yes. Oh, Commissioner McClure. Sorry. Um, I uh, yesterday w had an opportunity, a short conversation with uh, Charles about the prospect of the commission doing a tour of Banning Ranch next month. And I'm not sure how other commissioners feel about it, but for me, traveling up and down the state, it, it's it's extremely important for me to see a project and to see recognizing that staff won't have answers to this project but to actually give me a visual so I was kind of maybe asking to see if there's consensus on the Commission that people are in support of that kind of uh, activity well uh, I'll just speak to say that uh, Dr. Lester and I have spoken about it, Sherilyn and I have spoken about it, and I, I believe that every effort is being made to make that work for next month, but there still are some uncertainties around the agenda. Charles, right, that's, yeah, that's basically what it is. We, we don't know what the agenda looks like quite yet, so we don't know whether we'll have the time and to do that kind of thing. I think that there, there has been a strong interest on the part of a number of commissioners, including myself, to be able to have that um, that chance to visit the site to see this large project what's characterized often in public comment um, before us and so every effort I think would be good um, recognizing what you've said we, we are doing that and um, the other thing to keep in mind is exactly what um, Commissioner McClure said that if we do if we are able to get out there um, it will be an, probably an overview kind of field trip because there are many unresolved questions so there won't be perhaps the level of detail or certainty around certain things that people might want once they're out there. 
Right. I, but I, it would, but I, it would be useful to see the site for sure. Very good. Okay. We we just. What? How about this, Commissioner uh, Turnbull Sanders? Please. I don't mean to belabor the point, but I think this um, dovetails with my comment um, on the record uh, yesterday about, or maybe it was the day before, about uh, the need for commissioners, when at all possible, to see sites. And I think that, that this one certainly warrants a, a visit. So I just wanted to weigh in on that um, issue. Thank you. Yes, as a policy matter, we always try to uh, coordinate field trips in and around the timing of items. Uh, and this is definitely a, a major item that you'll be seeing in some form in the future. Thank you. Commissioner Zimmer. Uh, uh, just a, a question. Has the application been filed already? Uh, I, there was some issue about completeness. No, it has not been filed. Thank you. Hope. Oh. Thank you, Chair. We just received um, uh, we just received a decision in a case, and Deputy Attorney General um, David Alderson will report that to you. Yes, hot off the press this morning, received a ruling from the trial court in San Diego that where the court upheld the commission's approval in the case that was sin the San Diego Citizens for Open Government versus the commission. This involved the Reuben E. Lee Restaurant Sun Road project. Uh, basically, the court approved the commission's decision in that matter, and we'll be reviewing the trial court decision um, in the coming days. Thank you. And now that we have it, we'll distribute it to the commissioners. Okay. Thank you. Um, without any other comments and no more public comment, um, we will adjourn into closed session and uh, report out at the end of that. Thank you. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we are going to report out from closed session. I'll ask Hope Schmelzer, our counsel, to re make the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, in closed session, the California Coastal Commission received litigation information and advice in a matter of threatened litigation and gave direction to, to staff. Thank you. Thank you. And this completes the uh, May meeting of the California Coastal Commission.